All of our lives, isn't it? Yes. 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 Wonderful. So I have the pleasure of introducing Taylor King. He's presenting what connects us, indigenous peoples and all Americans. So I um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, and then, of course, he's going to be the star of the next hour. So Taylor, who is of Omaha and Cherokee heritage, is a full-time instructor at Creighton University, and holds a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College, as well as a Master of Business Administration and Master of Public Administration from Harvard University, where he served as a fellow in the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. He is the author of the manuscript, Rediscovering America, Sacred Geography, the Ancient Earthen Works, and the Indigenous History of Turtle Island. Taylor Keene is the founder of Sacred Seed, which educates and celebrates indigenous agricultural lifeways. Just a personal note, check that out. It's an amazing project. Taylor portrayed Chief Standing there in the Free Land, 1862, and the Shaping of Modern America Chautauqua from 2012 to 2015. He is also a former United States Nebraska board member. Please welcome Taylor Hewitt. Thank you, Amy. Aho, Amy, that long day. Ijaje, we weep that. Badija, Umaha, the in case of a Tom Mongolon. How is she doing, Tom Mongolon? So I'm speaking to you in the native tongue of my mother's people, the Omaha people, Umaha. Uh, that's what we call ourselves, it means the people that move against the current. And today we are in the homelands of the uh, Pawnee people, and not too far were the Poncas and the Omahas, in the land that we call. Alaska, <laughs> which means uh, flat water pertains to the flat river. So the impressions of my tribal ancestry uh, touches each and every one of us today. Before I get started, I would like to introduce my lovely wife, my rock and my muse, Jennifer. <laughs> she just reminded me that today is our nine month I'm very honored and pleased to be here today, and uh, I've had a long and varied relationship with Humanities in Nebraska. Uh, later on tonight, we're going to see the fruits of part of those interactions in history, uh, but I can uh, talk about some of that in the questions and answer how I became standing here after being a board member. <laughs> but uh, I was very excited about the uh, theme today, and I, I wanted to share a little bit about myself in the hopes that we all find exactly how we're all connected as human beings. So identity is the most important thing that we have as human beings. Without it, we are lost. With it, we are rich. And these are the questions uh, that I always come back to. I have found in my life that all of us humans have certain questions that are uh, always there in the back of our minds, uh, leading our lives. Who are we? Where do we come from? And where are we going? I wanted to share uh, a little bit about my maternal ancestry. And so we've got some images here. Uh, the one on the far left is my mother's mother and my mother's father. And uh, it's from him that I glean my tribal ancestry. So when I was doing my introduction, uh, what I was explaining is my name is uh, Buffalo Maine of the Earthen Bison Clan, which we call Black Shoulder. And uh, it's from him that I get my clan identity. My grandmother um, 
is where the French ancestry and the German ancestry in my family, um, that's where it comes from. And she was born clanless and was given the name Maybay, uh, which means springtime. So it's for those individuals uh, who don't have clans and have these different beautiful names. Uh, to the right of that is her grandmother, her own mother, passed away at a very young age with complications from diabetes. My grandmother was raised an orphan, but she always spoke very fondly of Mary Wood's Lieb, uh, which is my great-great-grandmother. And she was the one who married into uh, the German family. He was uh, reputably a, a small German man who only spoke German. My great-great-grandmother was quite tall. Yeah. And uh, they only spoke to each other in their own language, but uh, always seemed to understand one another. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to the right of that is uh, my fifth great grandfather, uh, Ongpa Donga, Big Elk. And he was the last hereditary chief of, of the Omahas. And uh, it was through his lens that uh, my people encountered yours many, many years ago. And he was the one who warned the tribe uh, that there was a flood of white people coming and it was going to forever change our life. The story that was conveyed to me by my grandmother about that time period that was passed on through the generations was he warned them and told them, prophesied that uh, someday uh, that language that they all spoke would not be spoken by some of their descendants. And the story that was shared in my family was that uh, most of them laughed. And unfortunately, uh, it comes today that uh, we're down to our last handful of fluent speakers. My mother is one of them. And uh, we're doing everything we can to keep our language going. Uh, I try to speak as, as much as I can and uh, learn as much as I can. On the far right is a picture of my mother. And uh, after she met my father, they got married. My father's side is Cherokee. I'll talk a little bit about that today. But she left her homelands in uh, beautiful Nebraska and moved down to Hard Scrabble, Oklahoma, Cherokee country, northeast Oklahoma. and. Uh, joined my father on a uh, Charlet operation, cattle operation, outside of Stillwell, Oklahoma. And it's kind of hard to see, but she's holding a little baby bee there. <laughs> and uh, in the background was uh, Casper, who was the Charlet bull that I remember. My first uh, memory as, as, a, as a little guy was being in the truck with my father, and he went out to hay uh, the cows and Casper wanted his hay first, and he pushed the truck back and forth. Oh, no. That's one of my first favorite memories. These are some of the core values that uh, are passed on through our tribe. Uh, when I began my introduction, uh, I used the phrase, hey, we like long today. And that's what we all say all the time to each other, which means we are all related. And that pertains to all the children of God. Regardless of the color of our skin, we are all related. As well within the tribe, need the wahi. That means water is life-giving. Wherever there's water, there's, there's life. And uh, just as we see today cities close to waterways, it's always been that way in this land <coughs> that we call flat water. Uh, Ukikawale, be good to, to uh, one another, and uh, to always be observant of your surroundings. Uh, the next part, I um, this has been near and dear to my heart for, for some time, and uh, the last individual that I'm going to go through um, is a very special person to me and recently gave me a wonderful gift, but I'll get to that. So part of human identity is the human being as warrior. And I want to 
wanted to start with, uh, this is my uh, grandfather from, from the Omaha side. We have a little bit more of a complicated system of kinship, uh, but he was the primary grandfather figure in my life. And uh, he carried the name of uh, Noji Nia, which means slow to rise. And his, uh, what it pertains to is uh, we're all from the bison clan. And uh, I didn't fully under, under, understand what it meant until uh, I actually had a very close encounter with a very large alpha bison. And uh, if you've ever seen them in their more natural habitats, uh, the main alpha bull will lie on the ground and uh, if someone approaches, which is what happened when I was visiting one of these herds, and I watched all the cows and the calves began to get up and they would move away from me, and I didn't see him lying on the ground perfectly camouflaged. And as I got closer, he was very slow to rise. Oh, and he turned and came at me about 35 oh. miles an hour. <laughs> and so uh, I told that story in the family, and they said that's what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the name that he carried. That's what we say, the name that we carry, because all of those names are passed on within the tribe. We don't create new ones. It's all those things that are important for a people to always survive. So the Earth and Bison Clan, we were responsible for the bison hunt as we came out this direction uh, from northeastern Nebraska towards the Great Plains where all the big bison were. And our job was to make sure that everyone in the tribe had an equal allocation of uh, bison meat. My grandfather uh, was, uh, he enlisted and uh, became a part of the Darby's Rangers and uh, helped chase uh, General Rommel across North Africa and then was in the liberation of France. And uh, he's the one who taught me um, how to break horses in the old cavalry methods. And he was also a tribal, today we call them horse whispers, but uh, such a kind and gentle individual. Uh, ironically, he uh, uh, landed at Omaha Beach and his uh, twin brother was killed there, and uh, he uh, told us later on how he could recognize that it was his brother, uh, Robert, who was lying in the, in the sand, was by his uh, Masonic ring and his dark skin. And so I came from a long line of Freemasons as well, tribal perspective. This is his son, this is my uncle Hollis. And uh, I've always found these really striking images. Uh, on the left, uh, he was a 17-year-old tribal warrior who volunteered, of course, to go, uh, which is one of the reasons I want to bring it up. Native Americans, as a percentage of our population, there is no higher percentage uh, of people who have volunteered uh, to go in the service for our great country. And, uh, he served two tours voluntarily and uh, was a uh, United States Marine and uh, recon at that. And I remember him telling me stories about um, where they would put him as an indigenous person. And he was always on point because uh, the Viet Cong were afraid of indigenous people. And their, and their bravery. Lots of uh, crazy, wild stories from that time frame. Uh, his uh, unit was attacked by a, by a big old tiger, and uh, they had to kill it. I didn't want to put that picture up, but uh, this one here, he was with uh, two of his really close comrades, one of which was fallen. And in our true tradition of honoring the warrior, I just love this shot on the right when he returned back uh, home uh, as a veteran, of course, as many of us know, not all Vietnam veterans were welcome home in an honorable way. But my 
of people we do. And uh, that's my grandpa Hollis there on the left, and uh, uh, another individual from around Lawrence, Kansas, where they lived at the time, and uh, truly in the, in the warrior tradition. Um, my uncle's Indian name is uh, Duma Mondi, and it means uh, four bison that will walk together. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention about uh, uh, my grandpa here is that uh, the name of his book um, is, is entitled, uh, They Never Called Me By My Name, meaning his tribal identity, which is the most important to us. The whole time he was in the service, no one ever asked nor called him by his name. <coughs> This is the story that has uh, touched my heart, inspired all this. Most recently, uh, I got contacted by my dear friend, lifelong mentor, and former colleague of uh, my late father, who was also a veteran. He uh, was in the Big Red One, the peacekeeping forces in uh, Germany and then served in uh, Korea. And uh, my father was one of the first Native American attorneys and uh, ultimately became the Chief Justice uh, for the Cherokee Nation Supreme Court and served with Dwight. And uh, I always knew Dwight as a very kind, gentle soul, and it wasn't until I was a little bit older and he had uh, published a book. Uh, and it's entitled 100 Miles of Bad Road, and it's about his role during the Tet Offensive uh, as a tank. Um, operator and his uh, superior was killed in his tank and uh, he got out as uh, uh, not even a non-commissioned officer and uh, led quite the heroic uh, battle to take over the tank uh, to find an abandoned one uh, that had more ammunition, climbed the top and uh, operated the, the gun there which uh, brought him two silver stars most recently. He was given the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, in his uh, note to me, he said he wanted uh, coins from there, and he knew how much I loved that book. It is not only dog-eared for me, but my uh, little puppy dog many years ago had <laughs> chewed on it as well. <laughs> uh, he said he would replace it, but it's too precious to me that he sent me one of the coins from his, uh, his time there, and uh, I just love that book because it embodies so much of what it was like for me to grow, to grow up in northeast Oklahoma as a Cherokee and to see him uh, continue those sorts of values uh, way across the world and uh, maintain his identity. It was very powerful. Origin stories. So uh, I was raised in many churches uh, down in the Bible Belt of Oklahoma, and uh, I think we're all familiar with this with this story. The tribal peoples we have similar stories as well. And uh, tonight, when I go on the stage, I always begin. Uh, my monologue is Chief Standing Bear with a story that is common to all the uh, Dagian, Suian speaking peoples the Ponca, the Omaha, the Osage, the Quapa, the Konze, the Kansa, and uh, the souls uh, are like stars in the sky, is what I refer to this story. And it is uh, beyond ancient for uh, indigenous peoples in America. Um, one of the chapters in my book that's going to be published uh, next spring and summer uh, tries to chronicle where these stories came from. But uh, our stories speak of us coming from the Seven Sisters constellation of Pleiades and that we journey uh, our souls do through the dark rift of the Milky Way to here. And we are uh, guided by the morning star, which is the next planet to us, Venus. And when our temporal bodies expire, 
that's how we go home to our heaven. So tonight I will share a different uh, interpretation of the, the Gian version of that story. And uh, the little teaser is, uh, our souls were like stars in the sky until one of the stars asked a very important question. So hopefully you will come tonight and, and hear the rest of it. <laughs> I wanted to get to the bulk of, uh, of my presentation, and it is my hope as human beings that we all find those things that give us inspiration. Uh, passion, I often refer to the economics of passion. My, my day job is uh, as a business professor, and uh, I teach capstone courses in corporate strategy and entrepreneurship. And, uh, this is one world, and that's my other world. I like this world a little bit better. <laughs> but uh, I often uh, preach to my students that uh, the most important vocation is finding your passion in life. Find what you do uh, better than anybody else in the world, whatever that one thing is, and you will forever be happy and it's no longer work. So I wanted to share a little bit what I've learned on this journey about uh, Sacred Sea, my nonprofit, is an offshoot of my book. Uh, my book is really about uh, ancient Native America, what was happening on this continent uh, 10,000 10, years ago, 1,000 years ago, and why those things are all important to us today. An offshoot of that was trying to understand what indigenous peoples ate and what things we find beautiful. So with all stories becomes a uh, beginning. This is uh, Dr. Deward Walker. Deward is uh, another lifelong mentor and friend. Had my father still been alive, uh, he'd have been very, very similar, uh, just like Dwight is to me. Uh, Deward was also in, in the Army uh, at the same time that my father was. And uh, Deward is the Chair Emeritus of Anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder. And uh, I met Dewar probably 35 years ago now. I was just beginning my teaching career and was just uh, entertaining teaching there at UC Boulder. And uh, met Dewar. Uh, we were both getting our old pickup trucks, getting our oil changed at the Grease Monkey. And uh, he liked my truck and I liked his truck. And we were super <laughs> tired ever since. Um, Dewar, uh, as an anthropologist, is one of the good anthropologists by that. Uh, a lot of indigenous peoples have had conflict with the field of anthropology uh, because of its um, biases and its origins, uh, perhaps to limit how long indigenous peoples have been here and perhaps to limit the complexities of our societies. And that goes back to John Wesley Powell, the uh, founding director of uh, what became the uh, Smithsonian Institution was one of the first directors and also the head of Bureau of Ethnology. That was the governmental entity that documented indigenous peoples. <coughs> and many of those anthropologists, uh, at least in my own experience when I was at Dartmouth College, taking Native American Studies classes, always had a lot of friction because they seemed to know more about my culture than I did and I had a lot of conflict with them. Um, Many of them were collectors as well, and when I met Dewar, he was none of those things. Uh, Dewar was uh, always gracious towards uh, tribal peoples. As a matter of fact, I became the bulk of his work at the Walker Institute, which um, uh, was to support um, important indigenous issues, and he served as a uh, expert witness in many cases around American Indian religious freedom and he's the one who taught me about a sacred geography, which is a major theme of my book, to understand uh, uh, the interactions between land and indigenous peoples is at the core of our religion. And uh, Dewar's got a wonderful uh, family trust uh, just up the canyon in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where uh, they are protectors of land there. And this was uh, a little bit after one of the terrible and horrible fires that uh, seem to be plaguing everywhere around the country today. And he was explaining to me how 
how the fire went down the valleys and the vents, and how his son saved their uh, old gold mill house uh, from burning down. Dewar's uh, always been a, a wonderful father figure, but also uh, a thought leader for me. And uh, over the years, Dewar uh, loves to call me up and uh, kick me in the pants, as I like to say, every now and again. And now about 15 years ago, he called me up, and this is how Dewar talks. Young man. <laughs> Hi, Dewar. No niceties other than that. What are you doing to protect your corn? <laughs> corn? Do what? Do it? Your tribal corn. I said, do it. I'm, I'm not following it. So again, explain to me. Uh, this was 15 years ago before there was a lot of seed saving movements, which we see a lot of today. And he was explaining how he was observing trends uh, in other places, one of which was about how some of these bigger seed companies like Monsanto and Syngenta were uh, displacing uh, indigenous seeds from the country of India from the people that grew them and introducing that onerous system of uh, con contact contractual corporate seeds that we do here in America. Anyone who comes from a farming family understands that uh, and explained uh, the complex intellectual property uh, laws in America around all this. And in essence, um, he was afraid that Monsanto and these other companies were going to do the same to our tribal seeds at the time and explained that ultimately, if any tribal corn gets cross-pollinated with the big genetically modified type corns that those companies would own our seeds. And I was very uh, disheartened by that. I said, Dude, that, that can't be. He said, yes, it can. And you need to research this, understand this, and to explain to others about it, and do what you can to protect your corn. So uh, unfortunately, that seed was just planted, and I uh, didn't quite know what to do with that. I didn't know anything about corn at the time. I'd heard some stories in the family. But soon enough, I was serving on the National Council for the Cherokee Nation. And during one of our Natural Resource Committee meetings, uh, Dr. Pat Gwynn, uh, the head of uh, agriculture for the Cherokee Nation, came in and he uh, put up a picture of the seed bank at Svalbard, Norway, and pointed to it and said, uh, what little seeds that we have, I'm not sure if we should put them in there, but we should be doing something like this. And uh, I remember what Dewar had told me and uh, shared my concerns uh, with Pat, uh, with all the rest of the counselors. And I remember asking the question, I said, Pat, do you think these big seed companies have our Cherokee seeds? And he nodded and he said, yes. And uh, I said, what do you think we should do about that? Because I was angry. And uh, he said, nothing. And I was shocked at that. And what he told me next forever changed my life because he shook his head and said, it doesn't matter who else has our seeds. What matters is that we, as Cherokees, find our former relationship with those seeds and embrace our indigenous agricultural life ways. Okay, so I began this journey to find those seeds um, that were here in the Nebraska and uh, learn more about the companion planting methods, otherwise known as the Three Sisters. So I got my little seed packet from uh, Pat and uh, the uh, Cherokee Nation Seed Saving Program, and I got some Cherokee white flower corn and some Trail of Tear Beans. I got some pictures of those in just a minute. And uh, then as 
is today um, Cherokee Nation citizens can order seed, but they're only allowed two kinds at a time. So my first time, all I had was two of the sisters, and I had to go to uh, a little seed library uh, over in uh, Vincent in Midtown, Omaha, and uh, found some uh, butternut squashes there, and uh, was glad to be able to, to borrow those. Ironically, that seed bank only came about because uh, my dear friend, uh, Betsy Goodman had uh, lobbied uh, the unicameral here in Nebraska to get a law change that would allow individuals to share seeds with one another. Up until that point, it was illegal for individuals to share seeds. So I was able to get, to get some of those. And uh, I didn't know much about growing things. Um, to get to some of my teachers here, but uh, Betsy was a good one. And I developed a... Uh, a wonderful relationship that I still enjoy today with a lot of the uh, Jewish farmers there in Omaha. And uh, we've gone out to Bloom Organic, and I learned a lot from her about how to grow corn. And I began to uh, ask around in the tribe about things. What I found is there were bits and pieces everywhere of uh, this knowledge around the three sisters uh, type methodology. With the Omaha's here, what I discovered is we had a four sister as well. So you got corn, bean, and squash. Uh, corn takes a lot of nitrogen out of the ground, and the beans put it back in. So we create these mounds, uh, often out of alluvial soil, and uh, plant the corn and the beans together. And the squash goes where we took the earth to build those mounds, although because it likes a lot of water. But as we all know here in uh, these lands that we call Nebraska, that somewhere in late June, early July, there's a big, big wind and a storm and it knocks everything over. That's why we have the fourth sister, the sunflower, and the tribes here plant them really close together, especially on the south side, to create a wall to try and block that wind and protect them. Uh, when I first, and uh, Kind of hard to see, you can probably see the colors, but here on the far left is what those seeds look like. And whenever I told uh, Pat that I was going to be planting up in Nebraska, he was very excited because he said, that's corn country, serious corn country. And I want to see what our seeds uh, that came from uh, the old Cherokee country in North Carolina. They worked with the Eastern Band, and, uh, worked with all these governmental repositories and university repositories to find some of our ancient corn. So uh, somewhere from the mid-1800s uh, is where those seeds came from. And as I was saying, they're, they were all sort of white and light pastel colors. But when I harvested my first crop, it was this full spectrum from uh, white multicolored to yellow multicolored to red multicolored to purple, orange, and red and black. And uh, I immediately took a picture of the university where I teach Creighton and allowed me to teach a seminar at the time and the students helped me harvest. We took this picture, a little money shot for Cherokee Nation Seed Bank. We put that in there and we sent it immediately to Pat. And I was very concerned not knowing. I didn't know whether or not we'd be cross-pollinated back to that big concern with some of the seed companies. Here I brought all these wonderful sacred seeds and uh, didn't know whether they had been compromised. And uh, luckily, about 20 minutes after he got my email, he immediately responded to my question of, have we been cross-pollinating? He gave a very scientific answer. Uh, <laughs> Ten different versions, one of which is, yes, the, the DNA could be degradated, but uh, probably not. And what he explained was this um, was uh, phenotype variation of the corn. That the corn knew how to adapt itself to Nebraska. And uh, corn is one of the most amazing plants. And uh, in the plant world, it has the most complex DNA. <coughs> of the animal world, which we are a part of, we don't often think that way, but we are. We have the most complex DNA. So I think that's why people admire corn so much. 
and uh, the, the, the plant uh, will filter out different types of ultraviolet light to optimize its growing and its new conditions around uh, sun, wind, rain, and soil types. And so it filters out all these different colors. And uh, when you look at those GMO corn crops here in Nebraska, which is an iconic part of the state's history, uh, you'll see that those uh, genetic clones are all the same color. These are not. Matter of fact, the, the shoots of a lot of these will turn red, as you see from one of them there. The whole plant will turn red. And uh, silks will be uh, different colors. Around here, you'll see a lot of uh, sort of purple silks. But uh, in some of these varieties, I've had lime green and all sorts of different colors in the pollen and the silks. So the plant is filtering out all those types of ultraviolet light and coming up with which varieties it would like for this piece. But I didn't know there was an orange core or anything else. And uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, it's very edible. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Chief Orin Lyons of the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, all corn is Indian corn. And uh, we should associate that with uh, Nebraska the corn huskers. Uh, in a lot of my research, I found that uh, you know, the moment of, of appropriation of corn away from indigenous peoples in this region uh, happened around uh, 1910, really. And that was where Oscar Wills Seed Company, he had been associated with the trading post here in Nebraska. And the first 20 years or so of his uh, seed catalog, he documented all the tribal origins and then in 19. 10 and 1911, he introduced his own varieties, which ultimately became uh, the varieties of seed corn that we see, uh, I'm sorry, feed corn uh, that, that we see uh, today. This is the Trail of Tear beans uh, that literally sustained my uh, father's people, the Cherokees, on the, on the Trail of Tears. And it's one of the first harvests, and you'll see these with all these indigenous seeds rich, wonderful colors. The symbology of the colors of this, uh, one of the reasons it's so important to Cherokees, is the same color of what we call wampum. You may have heard that term. It was used as currency by many of the East Coast tribes, and it comes from a type of clamshell, uh, which is uh, turned into beads, which are turned into our sacred uh, belts of the teachings from God to the Cherokee people. And so, uh, it's a beautiful thing to know that we mirrored our most important sacred ceremonial objects with, uh, with the beings that sustained us. This was um, in my backyard in uh, Midtown Omaha, and uh, as I was beginning to grow, my best friend uh, Andy, who owns a vineyard out in Northern California, uh, knows a lot about growing things. When I started the project, and had all these wonderful seeds. He said, Taylor, what do you know about growing things? I said, so much. <laughs> so you better find someone who knows how to do it out there. So I did. And this is uh, uh, all my friends from uh, the group called Omaha Permaculture, Gus Van Rowan and Graham Herbst, and yep. uh, a bunch of different folks there. And they came out, and Gus taught me how to take my backyard there. And, Midtown Omaha at the time, and to add all these permaculture elements, today they call it regenerative ag, I would note that many of those methodologies probably come from indigenous farmers. And so we dug all these little pits and began to transform our backyard into what ultimately looked like that. So this second picture was from the second story of my house looking down. This was at 12 feet. And, uh, First time farmers get really lucky. Oh <laughs> Why? Because when you till the soil the first time, it releases all this nitrogen, which the corn and the plants love. But unfortunately, it doesn't come back easily. And we also release all the carbon by tilling. So I uh, transformed my backyard. Next thing I knew, all the neighbors were interested in People came by with their kids to see it. 
Uh, newspaper found out about it. Television stations found out about it. Next thing I know, there was a documentary by uh, MBTV that came out and showed me singing to the horn and everything that I had never seen. Uh, I didn't know this was even possible, but it changed that whole backyard. Um, in these lines are at about uh, 12 feet, the phone line and the power line, and uh, the sunflowers reached up to 16 feet and fell yes. over the lines. Oh. And uh, can't, can't really tell which crops are which in there, but I also had um, planted some uh, Cherokee dipper gourds, uh, which loved to climb. They climbed up <laughs> some of the corn and over the over the lines and pull down the phone line. Oh, no. <laughs> so there was just it just transformed my backyard. All of a sudden, there was this whole ecosystem of life that was there. <clears throat> Some friends I made along the way: uh, Robin Wall, Kemmerer, Brady, and Sweetgrass. <coughs> I wonder means I break this up. Uh, there's the wonderful Tree of Life, which is symbolic for all the indigenous peoples and a wonderful symbol for my marriage and my wife. And uh, we picked her book to read in my seminar at uh, Creighton University. And one of the aspects uh, which led uh, to the name of my nonprofit, Save Your Seed, pertained to a chapter in her book, Ready Sweetgrass, I would highly recommend it to everyone. And in it, she had a dream after visiting Cusco, Peru, and, and the markets that were there. And uh, in her dream, she had gone out to go to one of the farmer's markets and to bring back her bounty for the day to eat. And in her dream, as she went up with her money to give to everyone to buy it from the farmer's market, they said, no, your money's no good here. We only trade for sacred things. So she had to dig into her bag and trade it for all those things. And uh, in that vein, that was her dream. And when my students read that, we had looked at all sorts of different things. I'm a business prof, so we teach entrepreneurship. So we were thinking, of how do we get big USDA grants? Or how big can we get? Are we a big seed bank? Are we a farm? Do we provide all this stuff? And after reading this, uh, we decided that some things are sacred. And, uh, those seeds that we have as sacred seed only, only uh, uh, give them out in honorable ways. Thus came uh, the work with a capital W, uh, what we called it, where we do everything by hand and till by hand as much as possible. And uh, the elders told me to sing to the horn. Uh, one of the wonderful things that happened along the way is I was trying to restore things back uh, the way that they used to. My clan, the Earth Advice Clan, are the keepers of the sacred red corn, and for all intents and purposes, we had lost, lost it. And so I went to the elders of my clan and said, I would like to bring this back. And they said, that's good. So I began my journey, and there was a wonderful individual by the name of Carl Barnes, Cherokee individual who, uh, by the end of his life of 85 years, had collected uh, almost 1,500 different varieties of indigenous seeds from all across the Americas, one of which was half an ear of uh, a rare variety called uh, Omaha Rainbow Fence. And this is that plant in my backyard. So we're all familiar with corn in the fields here. <laughs> Look at the height of this one. It had the most incredible brace roots on the foot there. This season had been a lot of wind and rain, and I lost almost every plot. Didn't lose any of these plants. And it yielded, it's kind of hard to see in this, but they look like ruby gems. And so I'm uh, proud to say that the Omahas have our sacred red corn back, and I am the keeper. Uh, I know the sound's not really going to play here, but this was. Uh, what the elders told, told me to do was to sing to the corn. And so I was going through and hand pollinating, which is around this time of year, uh, to take that pollen and get over all the silks to get those, those beautiful ears. But uh, 
that's what the elders told me to do. There's something about those positive vibrations that uh, connect us. Uh, they also, all, uh, all the tribes say to celebrate the harvest. And uh, over the years, we've, uh, at Sacred Sea, have had wonderful chefs and different people and different potlucks and all sorts of things where we take these three sisters and plants that we grew up, my wife and I continue that tradition in our everyday lives so that we can uh, celebrate and that's the true intention of Thanksgiving. Um, I wanted to say thank you for bearing with me this time and wanted to answer any questions that you may have. Yes? You said sing to them what did they tell you were you told what to sing or that's just what they told me and uh, I have uh, a number of songs that uh, I think that they like <laughs> and, uh, don't know for sure. <laughs> sure. Yana, oh Yana, hey nay. We Yana, he Yana, oh Yana, hey nay, oh way. Yana, oh Yana, hey nay. We Yana, he Yana, oh Yana, hey nay. We are not, he are not, oh, we are not, he are not, oh, we are not, and they, Yana, oh, we are not, and they, we are not, he are not, oh, we are not, and they, we are not, he are not, oh, we are not, and they, and I'll say that, and that connects us to it. I noticed that Lance Morgan talked about the organic farming for a ho chunk. Yes. And I was wondering if the Omaha tribe has thought about developing on the reservation the sacred seed and, and building an organic farming related to your corn. Sure. Taylor, can you repeat the question? Yes. The uh, question was. Uh, Ran an observation uh, about the neighbors uh, to the Omaha tribe, the uh, Winnebago tribe of uh, Nebraska, and the leader of their uh, economic efforts is uh, Lance Morgan, also a Harvard graduate, uh, and Ho Chunk Enterprises. And they've done an incredible job at building an uh, economic ecosystem up there for themselves and the surrounding communities. And they have a lot of efforts in uh, corporate farms and uh, while he was asking, what are the Omaha's doing? Uh, do they embrace these seeds? When I first started, the answer was no. Um, it was really frustrating. I couldn't get anyone from the tribe to come up. Uh, but that has changed dramatically. And we have an incredible project with the Omaha Nation Public School System. And uh, it's become a central part of their education there. And I how many teachers and structures they have for plants and plant medicines up there now, but they literally uh, feed the elders in the tribe. They have farmers markets and they're doing incredible stuff. And they have far surpassed what uh, I initially advised and others did. And, uh, they do an incredible job up there and uh, it's all the little people that are doing it. And it's so powerful to hear them talk about food sovereignty and seed sovereignty how we can fight diabetes and eat better and live well. Very important. Yes, ma'am. Well, I know the Pawnee uh, uh, has projects for the sea in this yes. area. And do you work with other tribes in they're trying to, you know, preserve their sacred sea and, and see what they have? Sure, yes. Um, the question was around the uh, Pawnee Nation Seed Preservation Project is led by my uh, auntie, uh, Deb Echo Hawk, and it's a really cool, powerful story. There's all these cool stories about corn, but that's, that's one of them. When the Pawnees, unfortunately, were disenfranchised from their homelands of two to three thousand years uh, by the good citizens of Kansas and Nebraska and removed to Oklahoma, they tucked their seeds and they would grow down there. Uh, Probably a little over 15 years ago, the late author and wonderful human 
being Robert Welsh, uh, gifted, yes, he, I, I miss him dearly, and he, uh, an incredible uh, gift. He, he gifted his own private land back to the Pawnees and asked them what they wanted to do. And they said two things, we want to plan our horn and we want to have our dances. Uh, I was there at their initial dance and got to witness them as they built in Earth Lodge. Um, there's one over here now too. Uh, those Pawnee boys come up here and they build all those things. But it reunited them with their own lands and they uh, developed a relationship with a number of growers. We don't have any of those growers in the audience, do we? And um, it's incredible what they've done there. And they brought back all these uh, those incredible varieties. Um, they have uh, one that on every kernel of the white corn is uh, a black image of uh, an eagle uh, flying on it. And another one is a blue variety, it's kind of a purple corn. And on each kernel is the little morning star symbol um, in gold. And it's just incredible. And some of the varieties that they lost, what they discovered over now probably 15 years plus of doing that, that, that growing, that uh, a lot of their lost varieties have come back in the DNA of that corn. And different, uh, I called them uh, robin eggs, sort of multicolored. And uh, just a few years ago, their sweet corn came back in through the DNA of the corn they were growing. They take those seeds out. So it's just amazing what the corn does. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How many farmers markets are more in the end in Thurston County? How many farmers markets are in Thurston? Yeah. Boy, I, I don't know the answer to that. Probably not too many. Uh, Macy and Winnebago, basically? I think so, yes. Not in not Pender, then? I don't think so in Pender yet. That's part of the Omaha uh, reservation. Yeah. But uh, hopefully they will continue to expand and, and to do all that work. But it's uh, so hope inspiring for me to see all the tribal peoples embracing their indigenous and cultural life ways. Thank you for your time and hopefully I'll see you tonight.